drill sergeant called us to attention, we yelled our company name. Don's already smiling. He knows where this is going. Um, but the day before graduation, we had a practice run. So we all marched to, uh, to Tank Hill in uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And uh, well, the drill sergeant, before he called us our whole, this is our whole company, it wasn't just a platoon. So we had 250 plus people in this, uh, in this uh, big group. And when he called us to attention, he said, I'm going to call you to attention, but don't sound off this time. Now, the time previous to that, if you don't sound off, you get in trouble. When I say sound off, I mean when he calls your attention, you yell your company name to the, to the top of your lungs. Well, I didn't hear this block of instruction. <laughs> and I was the only one that didn't hear this block of instruction. So <laughs> being drilled every day that when he called us to attention, we yelled our company name. It wasn't going to be just a little uh, coming out. So he called us to attention, and I get, let me turn this down just for a second. He said, company attention, and I said, Delta! And I was the only one. <laughs> and I heard the guy behind me go, stupid. <laughs> so... Last week we celebrated uh, Veterans Day, and like many of you who stood up, I also served my country. My first duty station was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and I wasn't really prepared for what would come over the next six months. Uh, our training was, uh, was six months. The first eight weeks of that was basic training. Mom, you remember whenever, uh, the day before I left, I didn't get any sleep. So... That day, I didn't get any sleep, and when we had the end processing, I didn't get any sleep. And then they woke us up like every couple of hours to uh, have us do something. So for the first three or four days, if you've been in the military, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You don't get very much sleep. So uh, here's my experience. Every morning, we marched uh, out on the exercise field long before daylight in the freezing weather. This was in February when I went in, so you can imagine it's pretty cold in South Carolina. Uh, we were pushed beyond our limitations, so I thought, on push-ups and sit-ups and other daily exercises. And once our daily exercise was complete, we stood in line for breakfast. We consumed our food very quickly because there was no time for talking in the mess hall. Everything was a, l a rush as we learned the art of hurry up and wait, and that was kind of the, the motto there. You hurry up and wait, and you would stand in line at parade rest, and you would stand with your hands behind your back and you would wait and then wait for the next piece of instruction. So uh, we, we took our showers, got dressed and made our beds for the morning inspection. These, uh, the day's activities hadn't yet begun. That was just up to this point. And you've heard this uh, expression that uh, we do more before nine o'clock than most people do all day. I think it's, it's probably pretty true because we were always busy. So our days usually consisted of marching several miles to a place of instruction where we learn the basic principles of survival. And then a long road march back to the barracks where we washed up for dinner and uh, shined our boots and folded our clothes and got ready for the next day's activity. After graduation from boot camp, I was shipped off to Germany and uh, I was there as a heavy wheel vehicle mechanic for the next uh, two years, well, the, the remaining part of a two-year enlistment that I had. So, like many other uh, endeavors that promote unity, and I think the military can classify as one of those, you'll find a mix of discipline and control. And I think the harder that you buck against the system, the more that you will uh, be confronted with physical and mental resistance. The goal uh, for the military was to build strength and unity. I think we got the same goal in the church, don't we? The strength came with exercise. The unity was harder to achieve. So looking back now, after being out of the military, I see uh, the wisdom and how they achieved it. They would take us to our uh, quote-unquote breaking point 
And that was the point where we realized that we couldn't survive without the team. No more individuality. It was all unity then. You can call it pride, but for some, this was probably the hardest obstacle for most to overcome because uh, like me, like many of you, nobody really likes to be told what to do. So fast forward 30 years later, I've moved out from under the control of my drill sergeant, and now I'm under the uh, supervision of my own convictions with a wife and seven children, a house, a farm in the country, my wife's van, my truck, a 40-hour work week, and many other responsibilities. I don't rely on an earthly authority to push me to be responsible to maintain them. I have to manage my life with discipline and self-control. However, I cannot rely on someone else to motivate me now. It has to come from my desire to be mature. So contrast these two examples that I've given you, my younger days in the military and my life as an adult, and you'll see that one is directed by a higher-ranking authority, earthly authority, I should say, and the other one is self-directed by my own convictions. I watched an experiment on, uh, on YouTube. I'm a YouTube junkie. Uh, but I watched an experiment that they did with a child. They put a child in a room by himself, by herself. They had several different kids that they did this to. And they put one marshmallow in front of that kid on a plate. It was a big marshmallow, too. Very tempting. It looked very good. And they told the kid if that kid could wait until they got back to eat that marshmallow, that they would give them another one. Well, at first, the kid would just look at the marshmallow and turn his head. And then it would look back down at the marshmallow and then turn his head. Pretty soon it would touch the marshmallow. And then it would pick the marshmallow up, kind of squeeze it a little bit. And then they'd pick it up and they'd smell it. What do you think came next? Just a little taste. They wanted that other marshmallow pretty bad, but they were going to try to wait. Pretty soon they pinched off a little piece of it and ate it. And then I watched every kid go through this exercise, and the majority of them, only one kid didn't touch it out of about probably 10 of them. But through the whole process, you can see the inner battle of that kid fighting off his craving, but ultimately give in to the desire because it was right in front of him. So our desire goes far beyond uh, food cravings and personal desires, but coupled with understanding and wisdom, it can help us to fight off the temptation to sin. It's the ability to overcome impulses in order to achieve longer-term goals. Rather than responding to immediate impulses, we can plan evaluate, and even avoid doing things that we'll later regret. So some of the great heroes in faith even struggle with this quality. If you probably remember the words of Paul saying, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's in Romans 7, 24. We're going to look at that passage in just a minute. Um, in fact, if you want to turn there, I'm going to, I'm going to read you a passage from Romans chapter 7. I'm going to start in verse 15. Now, I get a little tongue-tied reading this, and I tried to read it out loud a few times at home. Um, I understand the context of it, but I'm going to try to read it because it's like a tongue twister. Okay? Do I need this? No? no? Okay. Verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. 
Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that is work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Without self-control, our sin has no limitation. But I'm thankful that there's hope for us to change. The Bible gives us a recipe for dealing with a lack of self-control. And it was read before the lesson, but I'm going to go through it again with you. And then after that, I'm going to individualize each uh, different point. It is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. Actually, 5 through 9. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to your goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture portrays a great example of maturity. These are also building blocks of the faith. You can see how each spiritual quality that was listed has a necessary foundation, and without one, the other can't stand. So I'm going to read those. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Which of these qualities can you remove and still obtain maturity in Christ? There are seven qualities listed, so why would I put so much emphasis on self-control? For me, it seems to be the one quality that's the hardest to maintain. There are many more scriptures about self-control. Let's consider these. Proverbs 25, 28, if you want to follow along. Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. You, however, must teach what is appropriate for sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands that no one may, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything. Try to please them, not to, uh, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and, and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness 
and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Did you catch how many times that that passage had the word self-control? Or the... Can we achieve it? I say no. At least not alone. So, here's the recipe. First, we need to know where it comes from. 2 Timothy 1.7. Turn there, please. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So second, we need to strive for it by filtering what we set our minds to. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brethren and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why do we fill our minds with garbage? Third, we need to live by the Spirit to exercise and maintain it. This is where the self-control part comes in. So I say, walk by the Spirit. I didn't give you the scripture, but I didn't write down. Um, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you're not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, self-ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's that word again. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I would say there's probably a lot more to say about self-control. You guys have I've read the scriptures. I know that you've seen the, the verses that talk about that. It's not a new concept. But if you want to break that habitual sin that keeps... Uh, tangling you up and you know what I'm talking about I wouldn't ask anybody to raise their hand but I hope I'm not the only one here that finds myself tangled up in the same sin over and over and over but it seems to be something that uh, you know that's a that we find ourselves in so consider practicing the building blocks that was mentioned in 2nd Peter if you're having trouble with breaking that pattern yourself or you need prayers for strength Really, anything that you might want to come forward to, this is now going to be your opportunity.